Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to this celebratory event. We're celebrating uh, today the launch of our journal Tarka. Uh, I have a copy of it here. I will flash in front of the camera. Uh, this first issue of Tarka, of course, we've been publishing Tarka as a digital uh, offering for some time, just over a year or so, or maybe about actually almost two years now. Um, but this first issue is the first print uh, issue of Tarka. And this particular issue, we explored the concept of the practices and the teachings associated with uh, the tradition of bhakti. Um, and so today, or th actually throughout this entire week, we I've invited a number of the contributors of this issue of Tarka to join me on Facebook Live to explore uh, some of the topics that they wrote about and, and contributed to the journal. Yesterday, as you'll hopefully remember, um, uh, we were with Nina Rao. She came over to my place here in uh, Brooklyn and we chanted some kirtan and that's still available to watch and to enjoy. Um, and of course, Nina has a very lovely voice. So uh, if you like a bit of kirtan, be sure to check out that video on the Facebook page. Um, I apologize for the delay. We had a bit of technical difficulties. And so I had to switch computers and, and Hari Kirtanadas, who is here with me today, has been very gracious and uh, patient as we've worked through these uh, various technical details. So uh, once again, thank you for joining us. And so I am going to now welcome our guest today, Hari Kirtanadas, uh, to Facebook Live. Hello, Hari. How are you? I'm well, Jacob. Thank you very much for having me here. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, thank you for being patient with uh, all of those um, frustrating uh, shifts of the technical situation. I know that you've had those that experience yourself. Facebook Live yes. is certainly a, a, an interesting animal to, to tame. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm painfully well acquainted with the traveling Willoughby's. So, uh, <laughs> I know, I know uh, how it feels to uh, be where you are. So no problem. Yeah, well, I'm glad to be an understanding company. So um, thank you, first of all, for contributing to uh, this issue of Targa, which again, I will shamelessly plug by showing you the beautiful cover um, and the binding, if you want to see the beautiful binding as well. Uh, this issue I'm very excited about. Um, it is incredibly beautiful. And um, thanks to um, our wonderful uh, designer, who I should give a shout out to, Ryan Lemaire. Ryan Lemaire is the person who really um, many of the collage art um, that he, that is in the issue he created. And um, of course, he also came up with the entire formatting. And it really is a beautiful um, work of art. And then, you know, beyond the art and the design is are, of course, the incredible contributions, including yours, um, to the issue. So I want to talk a little bit about the article. And um, and so I'm just opening it up here. Uh, let me see. I should have put a bookmark in that space so I could come up with it very quickly. Uh, let's see. Page 89. Wow. Thank God you're here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the, the article is called The Two Kinds of Oneness, uh, Sri Chaitanya's Synthesis of Duality and Non-Duality. Of course, duality and non-duality are really popular uh, topics today, you know, especially in spiritual circles, circles, duality is often, you know, the bad guy and non-duality, the good guy. Of course, that then, of course, collapses into a dualism of its own, which is uh, the fascinating, you know, paradox. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that and, of course, how it pertains to the work of Sri Chaitanya. But just to, uh, as a way of preface into that conversation, I just wanted to read the first three um, sentences or three to five sentences of your article because it, it starts in a very sort of lovely poetic way. Conventional wisdom tells us that the paradoxical language of yoga's ancient spiritual literature signifies absolute oneness, that despite only appearance to the contrary, we're all one. The speculative metaphysics of neuroscience suggests that human psychology is just an autonomic meme machine with no one at the controls, that despite any appearance to the contrary, we're all none. 
Western religious traditions claim that an all-powerful, all-knowing, and ever-present God created the world and us along with it, that despite any appearance to the contrary, we're all loved. Contemporary seekers look, looking for a coherent resolution to these conflicting messages need look no further than Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's radical concept of a chintya abeda beda tattva, the truth of inconceivable simultaneous oneness and difference. So this is a really beautiful, you know, beginning to the article. It's probably one of my favorites. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's an incredibly resonant article for, you know, this current cultural context, which I'm sure is partly why you wrote it. Um, because of this, you know, sort of, like I was mentioning, this maybe misunderstanding of the relationship with duality and non-duality, oneness and difference, you know, and one kind of being castigated, you know, and one, and the other kind of prioritized. And so, you know, or, you know, valued at the expense of the other. So you obviously seem to be suggesting with your article that there is sort of a middle path, as it were, or there's this way of synthesizing these two that isn't so, um, you know, doesn't default to this kind of, you know, good guy, bad guy kind of scenario. So can you talk a little bit about that and your inspiration behind writing this article? Sure. My inspiration uh, behind writing the article goes back to uh, when I first became a yoga teacher. This is now 11 years ago, a, a yoga teacher in the modern conventional sense of the word. I've been practicing yoga for uh, 48 years now, uh, more or less, uh, and lived in devotional yoga ashrams when I was uh, in my 20s. And uh, it wasn't until much later that my teachers told me, you need to find a platform for teaching and yoga, you know, teaching yoga in the modern sense became that platform. So one of my, I was speaking with one of my teachers about my experience in the yoga community and how there seemed to be a, a sort of default assumption that uh, everything, every different aspect of yoga philosophy resolved in uh, a sense of absolute oneness, that we're all one. And uh, my teacher, Ravindra Saruprabhu, uh, said to me, well, you ought to tell him that there's two kinds of oneness. And what that means is there's qualitative oneness or our shared spiritual nature uh, that we are all Brahman and a quantitative oneness that we are at the same time in a uh, unique individual, that our individuality is validated by Vedic teachings and that we're all an infinitesimal part of an infinite complete whole. And there's a relationship between the part and the whole and that relationship in its a uh, state of complete fulfillment is one of transcendental love. So that's where the uh, idea for this article actually has its uh, seed planted, which is about 10 years ago. Uh, and I've been speaking about this topic uh, because it is not widely known in the yoga community. And, and even in my estimation, the underlying philosophy of the assumption that we're all one is not really understood from the standpoint of its origins in Shankara's mm. uh, philosophy of Advaita Vedanta or absolute non-dualism. So that's where the article comes from. And that's where the mm. name comes from. So I can't take credit for the name. This uh, is something that was given to me uh, by one of my teachers uh, for which I'm very grateful. Well, it's a great title. Um, so talk to me a little bit about Sri Chaitanya. Who was he and and what was this teaching that is, is so central to the article? So Sri Chaitanya uh, is a, was uh, a uh, spiritual leader and also a social reformer. And these two things uh, really went hand in hand for uh, Sri Chaitanya. Uh, he appears in uh, 1486 uh, and immediately establishes himself uh, as a uh, pundit, uh, you know, very learned uh, scholar. Uh, he, his, he took his birth in the area of India that was considered like the place to be if you were a scholar. Uh, but he also democratized the spiritual culture of his time by 
taking the mantras that were the province of the Brahmins, the heads of the society, the religious leaders of society, taking these mantras out of the temples uh, and bringing them in out into the street, literally out into mm -hmm. the street, uh, accompanying uh, the sacred mantras with uh, musical instruments, singing these with groups of people. And that is the origin of what we currently know as kirtan, the uh, uh, communal call and response chanting of transcendental sound vibration. Uh, his philosophy comes at the end of a series of philosophical developments. So there's, there's a, a historical track that you can follow. Uh, you have the um, Vedic rituals that predate the current age of Kali Yuga, which uh, according to Vedic calculation begins about 5,000 years ago. And as we move into Kali Yuga, the Vedic rituals, the Brahmins become corrupt. The, they no longer know how to chant the mantras in order to make the sacrifices work. And the whole thing just degrades into senseless animal slaughter. The Buddha appears and ends this uh, senseless animal slaughter in the name of Vedic rituals by disavowing the authority of the Vedas altogether and coming up with an entirely new philosophy. Um, then sometime later, Shankara reestablishes the authority of the Vedas by presenting an interpretation that sounds a lot like Buddhism, namely that Brahman, the absolute truth, has no name, form, qualities, relationship with anything or anyone. And what you get is something that's nothing because it has no qualities that sounds a lot like emptiness. So in this way, you have like a, a, a reestablishment of the authority of the Vedas through an interpretation of the Vedanta Sutra and other Vedic literature. Ramanuja, Madhvacharya, other subsequent teachers in the Vaishnava lineage uh, go on to actually refute Shankara's philosophy of absolute oneness with varieties of dualism and uh, conditional dualism and combinations of dualism and non-dualism. And it all ends with Sri Chaitanya who establishes this synthesis of duality and non-duality that you can actually have both at the same time. And he provides a rational explanation for how that is so. And my article is basically a revelation of what is Chaitanya's philosophy and, and uh, how does it make sense in relationship to these other philosophies that we generally assume to be the philosophical foundation of what we experience as yoga in the modern, uh, in our modern right. day life. So that is a very, it's an interesting, um, and what I hear you suggesting, and this is actually something that I was very recently reading as well, which um, is why it's on my mind is, is that are are you suggesting that the the that Shankara's philosophical articul articulations were were in some sense kind of a reaction against the Buddhist uh, teachings uh, that like that a lot of that um, philosophical development really was in response to what the the what the Buddhists were articulating at that time? Is that what is that partly that the way of understanding it? Yes, yes, that's uh, very much what it was. Um, the, uh, one of, uh, Shankara's accomplishments is reestablishing the Brahminical culture of the Vedas in a time and place when the Vedic culture and the Brahminical culture had been displaced, uh, by Buddhism. Uh, and, you know, this is one of the things that I really like about uh, what you've done with this issue of Tarka, uh, which is actually uh, very, very helpful to people who are interested in, in, in bhakti. We have a, an idea because we want to be inclusive and we want everybody to get along uh, that uh, there are many paths in one truth. And so there's yeah. really no difference between Buddhism and Advaita Vedanta and uh, Kashmiri Shaivism and Vaishnavism, that it all like, you know, ends up in the same place. Um, but if you think of the truth as a mountain, uh, there's lots of different ways to get up the mountain. The mountain looks different depending on where you're standing. 
Some paths go all the way up the mountain, like the beginner's slope, if you're gonna ski down, does not go all the way up the mountain. Uh, it, there, you can wind around the mountain, you can go straight up, it can go halfway, you can go three quarters. And it, you know, it just doesn't all land in the same place, even though there's always a relationship with the truth in some form or fashion. Um, and what you've done in the magazine is presented a lot of different angles of vision about what bhakti is and what it's, uh, how bhakti looks from these different positions. Because, you know, if you're a, a Buddhist, bhakti is going to look one way. If you subscribe to Shankara's philosophy, which is actually not exactly the same as, as Buddhism, uh, then it's going to look another way. And if you subscribe to one of the Vaishnava lineages or sampradayas, it's going to look different from what Shankara is presenting. And one of the things I did in my article, which frankly is a very transgressive thing to do in modern yoga, okay. is really I actually like make, an, <laughs> I, I make an argument, which is Chaitanya's argument. I'm presenting Chaitanya's argument about why Shankara's philosophy is wrong. Uh, and God, that's, that's just a terrible thing to say about anyone anywhere. Uh, I've gotten flack doing uh, yoga workshops where I say, well, you know, you're wrong or, you know, this is wrong and, and such like that. And, and that's right, hard for people can, to take. As if nothing can be wrong, yeah. Right. Yeah. And, now, now you may think I'm wrong and that, uh, you know, what I'm saying doesn't make any sense. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's also possible. You know, yoga begins with the proposition that we're wrong. The yoga sutras begin with the proposition that you do yoga in order to see the true nature of the self reflected back in the calm, clean pool of the reflective mind. Or you could be in one of these other states of minds. And guess what? That's where you are. You think you're someone yeah. you're not. You're wrong. <laughs> Uh, Arjuna doesn't want to fight at the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita and he gives all these reasons why he shouldn't fight and Krishna begins his teachings by saying you know you sound like you know what you're talking about but guess what you're wrong and the rest of the Bhagavad Gita is about what makes his arguments wrong so I don't think yeah. we should be too afraid of the idea of disagreement uh, as long yes. as it's constructive compassionate uh comparative philosophy in order for us to find the way of relating to yoga in general and bhakti yoga in particular that resonates with us, that lights up our heart, that illuminates our intelligence, and that makes us feel like we're making a connection. Yeah, I, I really love what you're saying because, um, it, you know, because one of the things that I think, like you're suggesting, that we see a lot is this um, this kind of inability to tolerate or inability to hold space for for disagreement. And if you look back, as you're saying, if you look back at the Indian tradition and the variety of philosophical perspectives that were that were there, debate and argument was institutionalized, and 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 there was something elegant and beautiful about it. It was a beautiful part of the whole kind of you know, the the supportive space around different sadhanas, different practices. Mm -hmm. And there was nothing, and it wasn't, it didn't imply some sort of, you know, it's sort of like disagreement equals evil or something that, that's like this weird association that we've come up with. And and I'm, I was thinking about this recently because I'm taking this Tibetan Buddhist philosophy course and auditing it. And 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 it's you know talking a lot about obviously the Buddhists have a long history of debate and and there's this one story in this uh, Robert Thurman book that I was reading where, you know it was like one you know one Buddhist encounters a a, a Charvaka or another you know and they and they have a debate that coincides with the rules of argument and you know the one had a very clearly superior argument. And so the other person sort of, you know, surrendered to the authority of that other, other person's position. And, and, it, and it, it just, it, it dawned on me that it, that kind of thing is so much, isn't possible really as much in our culture because people's identity becomes completely attached 
and integrated with their perspective. Whereas, whereas these, you know, these individuals in this, in this idealistic story were, you know, they weren't operating from the level of their identity. They were operating from the level of the principles of argumentation that would, you know, reveal the truth at a higher perspective. And it's sort of like, you know, living in accordance with a set of principles rather than accordance with like, you know, the integrity of what you think your, your ego is. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes total sense because as soon as as soon as you in our contemporary cultural situation, uh, as soon as you have the acknowledgement of the validity of disagreement, for a lot of people that creates an unsafe space because if their uh, ego is invested in a particular identity and a particular way of being or thinking about things that it feels like it's an attack on them. And the first lesson of yoga is we're not our egos. That whole sense of identity is, uh, or that attachment to that particular kind of identity is the root cause of the unsafe space that we find ourselves in, in the first place. Uh, You know, I, I want to be sensitive to these kinds of things for people, but at the same time, as a yoga teacher, I feel it's my responsibility to help people understand yoga philosophy as a way to navigate through an inherently unsafe space, namely the material world, as opposed to creating the illusion of a safe space within a space that is inherently unsafe. And yeah. that's a, a tricky thing to, to do, you know, because I don't, you know, I don't want to scare people uh, right out of the gate before I get a chance to, you know, present a way of thinking that might not have occurred to them. Yeah, uh, yeah. Which is usually what happens when I introduce this idea of a synthesis of duality and non-duality. It's just a way of looking at it that most people haven't heard before, or just never considered possible. But there's, But here's the evidence for the necessity of this synthesis. What the synthesis says, what Sri Chaitanya is, is proposing is, you can't have bhakti without duality. Love requires, the experience of love requires that there be a lover and a beloved and love itself, the uh, element that joins the two. But if you just say, uh, I'm going to become love itself, then you have to ask the question, well, love for who? Because love doesn't have any meaning without this beloved uh, uh, and the lover. So uh, what happens when you look at non-duality, absolute non-duality, is the only way you can explain it is by using dualities. You have to account for the existence of the world and our presence in it and all these individuals in this multiplicity of beings and things and places and such. And even in, as you'll read in my article, even in Shankara's philosophy of absolute non-dualism, he relies on a two-tiered conception of reality in order to explain it. So we have this persistent two-ness that keeps showing up in everyone's explanation of oneness. Yeah. And it's Sri Chaitanya's synthesis of these two that uh, allows both of them to be taken into account in a valid way that makes sense. And so that's what I tried to present in my article. Yeah, I really, I really like that. And I, um, uh, I appreciate this, this point about non-dualism because one of, one of the most frustrating things for me is that, you know, someone, it's very popular, like I was mentioning at the beginning to say something like, oh, I have a non-dual perspective or I'm non-dualist. And even to be in language, even to use linguistic categories is to be in dualism. You can't escape it. You can't, and to be a non-dualist suggests that there are those that are not non-dualists, which is itself a dualistic statement. So it's like one of these things that you can't really (laughs) talk about non-dualism. It's not something that can even be, it can be inferred, you know, it can be, but it's not like, it's not something that you can abide in as you are in, as you are involved in the world. Now that's not to say that like there is, there aren't sort of transmute transmuted levels of perception where you see the non-separableness of everything, but that's mm-hmm. not non-duality. That's a sort of, you know, that's a dissolving of, of arbitrary boundaries in a certain kind of way. So I really like what you're saying. And, 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 you know, just to go back to this point about the status of argument and debate, I think it's incredibly important. And it's one of the things I actually really want to encourage 
that's part of the spirit behind embodied philosophy is bringing people with different perspectives together and trying to encourage them to have conversations with each other, to not take those you know disagreements personally, and to really work towards clarity and also to have some humility around your own perspectives so that you can move towards you know a, a kind of refined knowledge because it because there is I think you know where you probably you stand as well is that all this sort of like melting pot of categories and philosophical systems and an inability to look at them too or an unwillingness to look at them too closely because you know you only want to see that they're all the same is leading mm -hmm. to a profound amount of confusion i feel like um yeah. in and confusion isn't necessarily beneficial <laughs> to the yogic process so can you talk a little bit about that and maybe specifically as it relates to this idea that we're all one and 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 maybe you know how does the how does the 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 kind of principle we're all one um, serve as an obstacle to the process of yoga? You've already been talking about it a little bit, but I'll just ask it more pointedly. Well, I'll, I'll elaborate on it, but um, you know, first of all, I just want to say I think you do a great job of uh, bringing a variety of philosophical viewpoints together in embodied philosophy, and okay. especially in this. Uh, premier issue of Tarka, because if someone reads, uh, my, yeah, <laughs> if someone reads, uh, you know, one of the articles by one of the other authors, um, and then reads my article, they might think, wait a minute, I thought I was reading a magazine that was all about the same thing. And this looks like two different things. You know, if you had swapped authors, uh, and their articles, uh, like, uh, if you had had uh, Pranada Kamtwa uh, write about the Narada Bhakti Sutras, uh, then you would get a very different conception of what the uh, Narada Bhakti Sutras uh, are telling us from the uh, uh, article that's there. Uh, uh, I forgot. Marie, uh, Marcy ba Braverman Goldstein. Yeah, now I know Marcy. Uh, and, uh, you know, she, so she's got one perspective uh, on that particular uh, scripture, uh, you know, and I know Pranada would have a, a different one. Um, so the fact that you've got these varieties of points of view in this one magazine about presumably the, the same topic is I think a, a wonderful service to readers uh, in order to uh, mitigate some of this confusion because it makes clear that there are varieties of uh, I, conceptions of bhakti and uh, what the ultimate goal is, um, and therefore what the purpose of the practices are, and then understanding of what the relationships are. And those are the three different categories of Vedic knowledge, knowledge of relationships, knowledge of practices, and knowledge of the ultimate goal. So from the standpoint of your question about how does the idea of oneness, uh, how can it be an obstacle to uh, like absolute Yoga oneness, I meant to say that. The, yeah, absolute yeah. oneness. So, yeah. Um, well, one way is that um, if you're if you're thinking that the absolute truth is absolute oneness, then what does that say about relationships? Well, it kind of negates them. Uh, it it invalidates relationships because if the only truth is absolute oneness, then relationships are, are an illusion. Uh, mm -hmm. And the whole idea of a you and a me who could have a relationship is an illusion. So what do we do? How do we respond to that? Um, well, if we say, well, the illusion is all the dance of the divine, that somehow one has become many and I'm the one, and now I appear to be many, uh, then you know, on, on the upside, we can see in terms of social justice, what is the basis of our equality? Uh, I use the same example all the time. You know, if I play a tennis match against Venus Williams, uh, I'm going to touch the ball. My, the ball's going to hit my racket when I serve. And that's it. I'm not touching the ball again uh, because we're not equal. Uh, and you can go on and on and on about all the ways that materially people are simply not equal. Some people are faster, some people are stronger, some people are smarter, some people are richer, some people are more powerful. There's just all this variety of material inequality. So in what sense 
is it a uh, self-evident truth that all beings are created equal? Well, that's a spiritual statement. The Declaration of Independence is based on a spiritual proposition that uh, on the level of the soul, we are equal. And that's uh, qualitative oneness. We're all made of the same spiritual stuff. And so in that way, the idea of oneness becomes uh, an asset to understanding what is it that uh, ties us together and provides a basis for uh, understanding what uh, justice should be. Um, mm. On the other mm. hand, if you have this negation of the world and it's just all a big illusion and relationships are all an illusion, and it's just the dance of the divine, then it can potentially provide for a rationalization for you to just do whatever you want. And then what you end up doing is just engaging in material life that doesn't actually burn up any of your karma or elevate your consciousness or do anything except provide you with a rationalization for enjoying the senses of the, of the material body. And you actually move away from the goal of yoga because the first lesson of yoga is we are not these temporary material bodies or senses of identity composed of mind, intelligence, and ego. We're something beyond that. And so, you know, if our uh, philosophical understanding degrades into a rationalization for material life, we end up going nowhere uh, or, and, and, you know, spinning our wheels here in the material world doesn't really solve any of our problems on a spiritual level. Yeah. So, so it, can, it can go both ways. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that nuance. Um, all right, Hari. Well, we have gone for about 30. I said I wanted to keep it close to 30. So is there anything else that you want to share either about bhakti, your experience with bhakti, the article more specifically, um, anything else that would be a nice kind of bring it home uh, moment? <laughs> yeah, the... Um... As far as the teachings of Sri Chaitanya go, um, the the conclusion, the philosophical conclusion, is uh, realized in the uh, practice that he recommended, which is mantra meditation, and uh, specifically uh, communal mantra meditation in the form of kirtan. He specifically established the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra as the practice by which theoretical knowledge becomes realized or experiential knowledge. Um, and this mantra, uh, I mentioned a little bit about it at the close of the article. You know, it's both a, a prayer and a fulfillment of that prayer uh, because it's a request for union with God through the medium of service motivated by nothing but love. And because of a non-duality, namely the unity of the Supreme Person with the Supreme Person's names, that is to say the Supreme Being is absolute, not relative. So it's not like the sound vibration of the mantra refers to something else, but rather the sound vibration of the mantra and the person or persons in this case, Hare being the feminine aspect of divinity, Krishna being, and Rama being the masculine aspect of divinity. The names in the Hare Krishna mantra are not different from the persons who are one person in two, uh, to which they re refer. And therefore, uh, the uh, chanting of the mantra means union with the persons that you are chanting to. So you get this experience of simultaneous oneness and difference in the very practice of chanting the Hare Krishna mantra. So I would like to um, you know, encourage people who are interested in the experience of this radical philosophical idea to try the practice that Sri Chaitanya has recommended uh, namely the chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra. That's great. Thank you, Hari, for ending with uh, a practice note because that I, I, that kind of um, 
uh, didn't occur to me to bring that in. And that's an important aspect of it is, you know, how do we embody uh, and sort of imbibe these, you know, seemingly very abstract teachings. Of course, we love that sort of stuff, you and I, uh, but yeah. at the end of the but day, it's not you know, just so armchair people... philosophy. <laughs> no, exactly, exactly. So um, that's very important. So thank you for, for um, uh, closing with that. Sure. So thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, this will be available, um, uh, it'll be a stay on Facebook. You can watch it um, again, if you'd like. Uh, it will also be on YouTube and we'll also be um, republishing it as a podcast episode. Um, I just wanted to mention uh, one last time the new issue of Tarka, which is available in print like here, I have here, and also as a digital issue. Um, and you can and you can subscribe to the entire um, uh, s uh, series of them, or as for a, you can subscribe to an annual subscription and get four per year, um, or you can get just a single issue. Um, and you can do that at embodiedphilosophy.com forward slash Tarka. Again, that's embodiedphilosophy.com forward slash Tarka. And I am just going to see before we close if we happen to have any questions. I didn't mention it before, so people probably weren't even thinking in that way, but I guess it's worth um, checking out. Questions? All right. No, we didn't. That's great, though. All right. Well, thank right. you, everyone. And if you have any questions for me or for Hari, you can leave them in the comments if you're watching this at a later time. And, uh, and, uh, and I'll keep an eye on it and let Hari know, and perhaps he can chime in uh, uh, I, I'll be happy to look for questions, um, and uh, if uh, audience members uh, can tag me in their question, or uh, Jacob, if you can, if you see something that I haven't gotten to yet and you want to tag me, uh, if it's a question that's directed to me, I'm always happy to uh, receive questions and engage in dialogue about this sort of stuff. This is my idea of a good time. Yeah. Super good time. So Harry, why don't you tell us maybe something, um, maybe how people can get a hold of you or how people can learn from you and anything you have coming up if you'd like to share. Sure. Um, my website is harikirtan.com, H-A-R-I-K-I-R-T-A-N-A. Uh, -A -A. Uh, I have a free Bhagavad Gita class every Thursday night. I'm heading into the home stretch with that, but anyone who subscribes to this free class uh, can get access to the recordings, which as of this Thursday will be 100 classes on wow. the Bhagavad Gita. I'm going to actually be able to finish it up with 108 classes. I'm so happy it worked out like that. That's crazy. Um, That's so amazing. you'll have uh, uh, access to that. And I also have um, a free online master class called Sanskrit Made Simple for Yoga Teachers. That's also right on my homepage. So if you'd like to check that out, um, it's free. Awesome. All right, so check out hari-kirtana.com for more and all those exciting free offerings you have. That's amazing. All right, thank you so much, Hari, for joining me today and we'll see you soon. Jacob, thank you very much. It's always great to talk to you. <laughs>